Alright, today's video is to take a look at the concept for grade 11 chemistry of limiting reagents. Um, consider an example here of a chemical reaction with more than one reactant. Now, in the lab, if you were actually doing this reaction, you'd be using some sulfuric acid out of a bottle, some sodium hydroxide solution. The actual chemicals in the lab are referred to as reagents. We can think of that almost as synonymous with reactants. So if you were to do this reaction with more than one reactant, more than one reagent, it's almost certainly going to be the case that in the reaction, one or the other of the reactants will get used up before the other. So one of them will get used up first. Whichever reactant gets used up is going to cause the chemical reaction to stop. For example, if we were adding some sodium hydroxide to sulfuric acid, making some sodium sulfate in water, if the reaction runs out of sulfuric acid, there's no more sulfuric acid in the reaction vessel, then no matter how much extra sodium hydroxide there might be, the reaction would have to stop. With no more sulfuric acid, you couldn't make any more products. So whichever reactant or reagent gets used up in the experiment, that reactant will limit the amount of products that you can form. It determines the amount of product you can form. As a result, we call that reactant, the one that gets used up, the limiting reagent. It's the reactant that gets used up and limits or determines the amount of products that can form. Any other reactants that are in the vessel um, would be called excess reagents because they're going to be left over at the end, some of them, so therefore you'll have some excess amounts of all the other reactants. Now it is theoretically possible that you could mix exactly the right amount of sulfuric acid and sodium hydroxide so that they both get used up. In that case, both would be considered limiting reagents and you could use either one of them to determine how much product you make. Students often find limiting reagent problems to be a little bit more challenging um, in stoichiometry than the, than the uh, ones we've been doing up till now. How do you recognize a limiting reagent problem? It's not going to say on a test this is a limiting reagent problem. It probably won't even ask in the question to determine the limiting reagent like we see here. Instead, you have to get, recognize a limiting reagent problem because in the question, you'll see that you're told exactly how much you have. Now, that might be grams, it might be moles, it might be liters. You'll be told exactly how much you have for more than one reactant. So for example, take a moment, pause the video, read this question. So the student has added two grams of aluminum, that's one reactant, to a solution with 0.1 moles of copper chloride. So with not reading anything more in the question, I can tell from that sentence that this is going to be a limiting reagent problem because we've got two reactants given, aluminum and copper chloride, they're the two reactants, and we're told exactly how much, two grams of aluminum, 0.1 moles of copper chloride, we're told exactly how much we have for each. So therefore, that's the visual clue that we're dealing with a limiting reagent problem. Now we're told in this question that when the reaction is completed, 4.27 grams of copper metal was isolated, in other words, was produced. Now the copper is, is a product, it's the product being isolated. So it's not one of the reactants, it would not be part of the, it wouldn't be considered a limiting reagent because the reagents have to be reactants. To start with, let's write a balanced chemical reaction. So again, pause the video and see if you can do that. So we've got some aluminum metal, Al, and we're reacting it with copper 2 chloride. So copper 2 means the copper is 2 positive, and chloride is a halogen. Its formula, its charge would be 1 negative. So CuCl2 would be copper 2 chloride. I'm going to omit the phases for this, but the states of matter, but the aluminum would be a solid, and because this was a solution, it would be an aqueous uh, copper 2 chloride. 
Now just looking at those two reactants, an element is reacting with an ionic compound, I can tell that this looks like a single replacement reaction. A single replacement reaction. Now, now that I know it's a single replacement reaction, that's the classification, I can predict what the products would be. The aluminum is going to go in and become aluminum 3 positive, and it's going to bond with the chloride ions, which are negative, and that's going to give me a new ionic compound, aluminum chloride. And then I'm going to get the copper come out as the element copper. Okay, and so there's an element reacts with an ionic compound, makes a new ionic compound, and a new element, and that's the characteristics of a single replacement reaction. Now let's balance the equation. You can't do a stoichiometry problem unless you have a balanced equation because you need the ratios to do stoichiometry. That's what stoichiometry is about, using the ratios in the equation. So let's take a look here at the chlorines. They jump out at me because there's two on the left and three on the right. I can make them equal by putting a three as a coefficient there. Three times two is six and a 2 as a coefficient there. 2 times 3 is 6. The 3 in front of copper chloride gives me 3 coppers, so I'm going to need a 3 in front of the Cu. And the 2 in front of aluminum chloride gives me 2 aluminums, so I'll put a 2 in front of aluminum. There's my balanced equation. Now we can identify uh, the limiting reagent. If you know what you're doing, um, pause the video and try it yourself. If not, walk, walk through it with me. What we're going to do to identify the limiting reagent is pick one of the two reactants given in the question. It does not matter which that we start with. And what we'll do is we'll ask ourselves, how much of the other reactant do we actually need to use up all of the one that we started with? For example, let's start with 2 grams of aluminum metal. So we'll take 2.00 grams of aluminum. And what we'll do is we'll ask ourselves, how many moles, since we were given moles in the question, how many moles of copper chloride did we actually need to use up all of this aluminum? So use your, your balanced equation to answer that question. How many moles of copper chloride do we actually need to use up the two grams of aluminum? To answer that, we'll set up some unit multipliers. We'll convert the grams of aluminum into moles of aluminum. That's just using aluminum's molar mass or a periodic table. And then we'll use the balanced equation to convert the moles of aluminum into moles of the other reactant, which was copper chloride. Now in this question, because we were given moles of copper chloride in the problem, we're going to stop right here. If we had been given grams of copper chloride, we would just add one more multiplier to convert moles to grams. So the molar mass of aluminum from a periodic table, one mole is 26.98 grams. And from the balanced equation, we can see that two moles of aluminum will react with three moles of copper chloride. So two moles of aluminum react with three moles of copper chloride. Grabbing a calculator, 2.00 divide by 26.98 times by 3 over 2, and we're going to keep three significant digits in the answer. So 0 0.111 moles of copper chloride, and let's let's put a little a statement with that. This many moles of copper chloride are needed to use up all of the aluminum. Okay, so to use up all of the 2 grams of aluminum, we would need 0.111 moles of copper. Now look back at the question. It told us that we have only 0.1 moles of copper. So we don't have enough copper to use up all of the aluminum. So we can say here, but we have only 0.1 moles of copper chloride, which means it's not enough. So if that's not enough copper chloride to use up all of the aluminum, the copper chloride will be used up. Copper chloride is going to get consumed. So therefore, the copper chloride will be 
our limiting reagent. Now suppose the answer we had had here had been not 0.111, but suppose it had been 0 0.085 moles of copper chloride. If we decided that we would only need 0 0.085 moles, and we noted that we had 0.1 moles, we would conclude that we have more copper chloride than we need. Since we have more than we need, the copper chloride would have been an excess reagent and then we would have come to the conclusion that aluminum was the limiting reagent. All right, so one of them is an excess, the other is limiting. So we can say here that therefore the aluminum is in excess in our problem. So we're going to be left over with some aluminum metal and the copper chloride is used up completely. Now, now that we've found the um, limiting reagent is copper chloride, we can use that to figure out the theoretical yield of copper metal, which is what we're being asked for here, how much copper metal in grams will form in this reaction. Okay? So the key is to start this calculation using the limiting reagent. So our limiting reagent was copper chloride, and we had 0 0.100 moles of copper chloride in the problem. So let's take that and switch from moles of copper chloride using our balanced equation to moles of copper metal. So now I know how many moles of copper metal will be produced, but the question asks for the yield in grams. Now the yield again means product, right? And theoretical means the answer to a stoichiometry problem essentially. How much should we expect to make theoretically? So we'll get rid of the moles of copper and we'll switch to the grams of copper using copper's molar mass on a periodic table. So moles of copper, moles of copper chloride, that comes from our balanced equation and it's a 3 to 3 ratio and I'm just going to put those in. If you wanted to reduce that to 1 to 1, go for it. The moles of copper metal, one mole of it from a periodic table, 63.55 grams of copper equals, grabbing a calculator, 0.1, this is just a 1, it cancels out, so 0 0.1 times 63.55, keeping three significant digits, 6.36 grams of copper will, or maybe not will, but should be produced. So that is our theoretical yield. Okay, that's how much will be produced. Um, now in the experiment, the person did not collect 6.36 grams. They collected, they isolated only 4.27 grams of copper. All right? So they did not actually get as much copper as they thought they should. Now it's possible that the chemical reaction itself is causing that. In our grade 12 chemistry class, we're going to deal with what's called an equilibrium system, and that's a system where the products can break back into the reactants, and that means the theoretical yield is never going to be 100% of what you thought it should be. More likely, in a situation like this, you're simply losing some copper metal. Um, the copper metal would probably have been filtered from the solution, and then dried and weighed. It's possible during the filtering that you lost some copper and maybe some was spilled along the way. Maybe you didn't wait long enough for the reaction to complete and so you didn't collect all the copper you were supposed to. In, either, in any of those situations, we can calculate the percent yield. It's simply equal to the actual yield. In other words, the actual amount of product that you produced or isolated divided by your theoretical yield, what you thought you should get, and you multiply by 100. So take what you actually got in the lab, divide by what you theoretically should have got, and times by 100. So in this case, we, sh we actually got 4.27 grams, but we thought we were going to get 6.36 grams and multiply by 100. So doing that on a calculator, you get an answer of 
percent yield. All right, so there's a typical stoichiometry problem involving limiting reagents. Again, the, clue, the key, the clue that we were looking at a limiting reagent problem was number one, there were more than one reactant, and more importantly, we were told exactly how much of each reactant we were given. When you know exactly how much of each reactant you're given, you know that you're going to be dealing with a limiting reagent question. If we were only given one of the reactants, if we were asked, a student had used two grams of aluminum metal, how many grams of copper were produced, we'd be making an assumption to answer that question. We'd be assuming that that aluminum gets used up. In other words, we'd be assuming that the aluminum is the limiting reagent. So if you're ever doing what's called a simple stoichiometry problem, you're assuming that the reactant you're given is the limiting reagent. If you're actually given the amounts of more than one reactant, then you can no longer make an assumption. You have to start by calculating which of the reactants is limiting, then use it to figure out how much product you should make. All right, if you understand that, jump in and try this second question on your own and then play the video to see how you're doing. So we've got a 25.0 liter vessel so I see right away that that's a volume, um, was filled with propane gas at STP. Now when I see that STP and a volume given, a unit multiplier immediately jumps into my head. I know that one mole of any gas at STP has a volume of 22.4 liters. And so I know that I could use that fact as a unit multiplier to convert this volume of 25 liters into moles of propane if I need to. Let's keep reading. This amount of propane was combined with 500 grams of oxygen gas and then the mixture was ignited. So we're combining propane and oxygen gas and igniting it. We'll classify and write a balanced equation. We'll have to pause the video and try this yourself. Propane is reacting with oxygen, and that looks pretty clearly, if you know your reaction types, as a hydrocarbon, a molecule made of carbon and hydrogen, combustion reaction, the word ignites, or to react with oxygen. So this is a hydrocarbon combustion reaction. Hydrocarbon combustion reactions are, are simple on one level because the products of them are always the same. You'll have a different hydrocarbon to begin with. There are lots of different kinds of hydrocarbons. But they'll always react with oxygen, and they'll always produce carbon dioxide gas and water vapor. All right, So those are always the products of hydrocarbon combustion reactions. So let's balance the reaction. We have three carbons on the left. We'll put a three CO2s on the right. We have eight hydrogens on the left. We'll put a four waters on the right. Four times two is eight hydrogens. Three times two, there's six oxygens in the carbon dioxide. Four times one, there's four oxygens in the water. Six plus four is 10. We'll put a five in front of the O2. Five times two is 10 O's on the left. So there's the balanced chemical reaction. And again, I've left out phases. This is probably, everything here is probably a gas phase. Since it's a combustion reaction, the water would be produced at high temperature and will come out as water vapor. So let's identify the limiting reagent and use calculations to support the answer. In the last example, we said to do this, you would pick either one of the reactants as your starting point and calculate how much of the other reactant do you really need to use that up. So I'll take the propane, since it's given first in the question, and it doesn't really matter. You could start with oxygen if you prefer. I'm going to take the 25.0 liters of propane, and I'm going to go calculate for myself how many grams of oxygen did I really need to, to burn up this propane. So to do that, we'll take the liters of propane, and we'll start by switching that to moles of propane. 
we're going to use that unit multiplier right up here, 22.4 liters is one mole. And then we can use the balanced equations, ratios, to get moles of propane converted to moles of oxygen. And then, because the question gave us grams of oxygen, we'll convert moles of O2 into grams of O2. So one mole of propane, 22.4 liters. From the balanced equation, five moles of oxygen would uh, react with one mole of propane, five to one. And then the molar mass of O2, not just O, but O2, one mole of O2 weighs, or has a mass, rather, of 32.00 grams. Now, I should just remind you that this, this unit multiplier of 22.4 liters represents one mole. That's only true at STP, standard temperature and pressure. So a standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius. Standard pressure is one atmosphere, or 101.3 kilopascals, or 760 millimeters of mercury. There are several units for pressure. Later in our gases unit, We'll deal with that in a bit more detail and consider situations where you're not at STP. All right, so now we can grab a calculator and we can determine the mass of oxygen that would have been needed to use up all of that propane. So the answer I got was 178.56 or something like that. I rounded it off to three significant digits, 179 grams of oxygen are needed to use up, or to burn if you prefer, all the propane. Now, see if you can stop and figure out which of the reactants then must be limiting. The key is to go back and look at how much oxygen we have. So we look back at the question and we noticed we have 500 grams of oxygen, which means we have excess oxygen. We needed only 179 grams, but we actually have 500. So since oxygen is the excess reagent, we can therefore conclude that the propane C3H8 is limiting. Okay, whichever reactant is not in excess will be the limiting reagent. So now we can answer the part C, what mass of carbon dioxide will be produced. Another way to say that would have been to ask what is the theoretical yield in grams of the carbon dioxide. That would mean the same thing. To answer the question, we have to start with the limiting reagent, which was the propane. So we're going to go back and use our 25.0 liters of propane as our starting point here. And we will, again, convert that from liters to moles of propane. Then using the balanced equation, we're asking how many grams of carbon dioxide. So in the balanced equation, three moles of carbon dioxide come from one mole of propane. So we can convert moles of propane into moles of carbon dioxide. And then, using the molar mass of carbon dioxide, moles of carbon dioxide back to grams of carbon dioxide. So one mole of any gas, including propane, at STP is 22.4 liters. From the balanced equation, we just saw three moles of carbon dioxide come from one mole of propane. And using the periodic table, the molar mass of CO2, one mole weighs 44.01 grams. So grabbing a calculator, we get 147 grams of carbon dioxide should be produced. That's our theoretical yield of the carbon dioxide. Part D says, how many moles of the excess reagent, 
are going to be left over? Well, at the beginning of the question, when we flipped a coin in Part B and decided to start with the propane in order to determine which reagent was limiting, remember we could have started here with the oxygen, the 500 grams of oxygen if we wanted to, we actually found that we needed 179 grams of oxygen, but we, but we had 500 grams. So to ask how much of the excess reagent is left over, it's going to be very easy for us here, right? We can just subtract those numbers. If you had started this answer not with the 25 liters of propane, but instead with the 500 grams of oxygen, you would have calculated the mass or the uh, number of liters, I guess, of propane that you would have needed, and you would have found out that you needed more than 25 liters of propane. So you would have said, we don't have enough propane, and propane is limiting. You would have come to the same conclusion. But if you're wanting to know how many moles of the excess reagent remain, you would have to now go back in this Part D, and you would have to do all of this again. You'd have to do what I did here to find out how many grams of oxygen are used up. So what I'm going to do is simply subtract 500 grams, the amount that we had, 500 grams of oxygen, minus the 179 grams of oxygen used up, and I get 321 grams of oxygen left over or remaining. So now we can just take that and one unit multiplier, convert that back to moles. So 321 grams of O2. We'll get rid of grams of O2 and switch that to moles of O2. Again, using the molar mass from a periodic table, one mole is 32.00 grams. O2 has two O's in it. And we get 321 divided by 32, we get 10.0 with three significant digits. 10.0 moles of O2 um, are in excess or remain. All right, so there's two examples of limiting reagent problems. They're a little bit more involved than simple stoichiometry problems. And on a test or exam, um, it may be that you'll get a question like this, which was broken down into steps for you. Write a balanced equation, identify the limiting reagent, how much pro that may be how the, t the, t the uh, question is worded. More likely on a test, you'd be given this statement up here, 25 liters is, uh, of uh, propane at STP reacts with 500 grams of oxygen. And then you would have been asked this question directly. What mass of carbon dioxide would be produced? So you would have to then say to yourself, well, I, to answer the question, how many grams of CO2 will be produced, I'll need a balanced equation. Then you'd have to recognize, hey, this is a limiting reagent problem. I need to figure out which reagent was limiting because I'm going to use the limiting reagent to find out how many grams of CO2 would be produced. So be prepared on a test or exam question to have to figure out that you need a balanced equation to solve it and then to recognize that it was a limiting reagent problem and not just a simple stoichiometry problem. So I hope that helps with uh, introducing or reviewing stoichiometry and limiting reagents. That should be good for both the test, unit test, and for the exam in grade 11, regular or advanced chemistry.